the polite ones at least, would call me a monster, a blood-drinking freak. And as Regis suggests in his words to Geralt, that is the best a higher vampire can hope for when being addressed by humans. And I'm afraid to say it isn't unwarranted. Higher vampires truly are the most powerful creatures in the universe, and even if they can submit to reason and camaraderie and mercy, there is no denying how destructive it would be to eye one of these ancient beasts. Fortunately, higher vampires are incredibly rare, and most mortals would go their entire lives without ever encountering one. Fewer still would recognise one if seen. But when urgent business takes us to the beautifully vivid expanses of Toussaint, we'll soon discover that these creatures are active and causing chaos in Beauclair. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to my Witcher lore and mythology series. Today we're going to be tackling the biggest topic of all, higher vampires. There are many fascinating monsters in the universe, enough to make countless videos on, but nothing comes close to the higher vampires. Not only are they unbelievably powerful, but they are so old and shrouded in mysterious folklore that very few know the truth of their ancient origins. And if that wasn't enough, they are also completely misunderstood repeatedly misclassified and subsequently underestimated. Through our journeys we'll come across many imposters and many lesser vampires who scholars wrongly consider higher vampires. Lesser vampires like Bruxae, Alps, Catacans and Nosferats should be handled with plenty of prudence and mistaking them for a weak foe would be foolish but these bloodsuckers can be killed even if that means killed with great difficulty. True higher vampires, however, no mortal can kill them, nor can any other powerful beast in the universe. If a witcher of Geralt's capabilities chopped down a higher vampire, leaving it in bite-sized chunks strewn across the ground, the thing would regenerate, returning to full health eventually, years and years later. These things cannot be stopped by anyone who is not also a higher vampire. And if you're sitting there watching this video laughing with a garland of garlic draped over your neck and a goblet of holy water at your side, you'd best be warned. The wives' tales may work on the lesser variety, but to higher vampires they'll murder you swiftly before snacking on the cloves and washing it down with your still warm blood. But a lot of these misconceptions about higher vampires will be revealed as we meet them in Beauclair. So let's leave it at that and saddle Roach ready for our ride on this glorious summer day in Toussaint. Now aside from a giant armed with a grain grinder and a wine barrel adorning his head, the journey south to the land of Toussaint is like something out of a fairy tale. The capital city of Beauclair waits in the distance in all of its majesty, with spires reaching up into the perfect blue sky. And on the way, excited cheers fill the air from the tawny grounds. Coalescing with the birdsong, every breeze is packed with the sounds of life well lived. It is a wonderfully welcome contrast to the drab dreariness of Temeria and the Northern Kingdoms. Yet there is an unspoken fear behind everyone's jaunty expression. After the body of Count Louis Delacroix was found washed up on the banks of the Sans Retour, something began to smell a bit fishy. The Beast of Beauclair is at large somewhere in the city, and the presence of a Witcher is a harsh reminder of the dangerous reality. Our first hint that vampires are involved comes from the confrontation at Corvo Bianco. A Bruxa can be found in the cellar, meddling with the corpse. This Bruxa shows signs of intelligence beyond the average Bruxa. It is articulate, and it is on an important mission clearly for someone far more influential. Here it's worth going into a little more detail about the classification misconceptions I mentioned earlier. It can be quite confusing determining what is and isn't a higher vampire, and a lot of the time it is quite subjective. Some say a higher vampire is an intelligent vampire, one with motives beyond simply quenching blood first. But I'm going to counter that by saying I think a true higher vampire can only apply to those within the society of immortals. If a vampire can be killed by a witch's blade, then it is a monster, a lesser creature. True subjects of this discussion are not so easily slain, so we can ignore this Bruxa, or discuss her further in a later video. Moving on, we will find ourselves in the employ of Duchess Anna Henrietta of Toussaint, and our search for the identity of the Beast of Beauclair will soon come to an end. We locate the culprit in the greenhouse, and after the subsequent chase we will learn a great deal about two true higher vampires. The hand reclaimed by the Bruxa belonged to Detlaf van der Eretine, a higher vampire. By the time we show him his severed body part, he's grown a new one. Detlaf's face becomes feral during the fight. He becomes ethereal, turning to a crimson mist, and he strikes ferociously with long gangly claws. But this is only a small taste of his power, and as he moves in for the kill, his claws impale another higher vampire, Emil Regis Rahelic Terzif Godfrey. And as we engage in conversation with this old friend, he seems completely oblivious to the gaping bloody hole in his chest. 
Now there's an awful lot to explain here, as the difference between regular vampires and higher vampires becomes crystal clear. Regis is a friend of Geralt's, and when they met for the first time in the year 1267, eight years prior to this moment, Regis was over 400 years old, relatively young for a higher vampire. Geralt first met Regis in the book Baptism of Fire. Regis resided in an old elven cemetery named Fen Khan, and this was where he brewed his famous Mandrake Moonshine. Regis is known for being a very rational and empathetic character. He has sworn off of drinking blood for satiating that desire works much like alcoholism in humans, only much stronger. As a youngster, he partook in the consumption of blood, but it made him savage and unpredictable. One day it led him to being caught by villagers who discovered his secret. They killed him, decapitated him, stabbed him repeatedly with wooden stakes, drenched him in holy water, and then finally buried him beneath the dirt. It was here, under the ground, that Regis had his epiphany and changed his ways. It was quite the wake-up call. He spent the next 50 years regenerating, in which time he reconsidered his life choices and swore off of the influence of blood. It's rather incredible. You could make the argument that some entities in the Witcher universe are more powerful than higher vampires, say a djinn for example. But if a djinn is captured or killed, that is that. Dust off your hands and head to your local for a celebratory drink. But with a higher vampire, nothing you do, no matter how horrifically gruesome, can truly kill them. They will recover, and for the average higher vampire lacking Regis's sophisticated talent for self-reflection, there will likely be a grudge. So this thing that you've killed will be back, and it will get revenge on you. The only way to stop it is at the hand of another of its kind. Now that's terrifying. Anyway, when Geralt and Regis are reunited in the year 1275, the Witcher says, How's this even possible? Last I saw you. To which the higher vampire responds, I was a bubbling, shapeless smear, having been rather spectacularly melted into a column of a certain castle, in somewhat better shape now as you can see. Hardly peak form, mind you, but were I human, folk would think me a demigod, I dare say. Now what he is referring to is another of his run-ins with what us humans call death, only this was a far more impressive recovery. During the Second War with Nilfgaard, the assault on Stigger Castle took place in the year 1268. During this assault, Regis came face to face with a powerful young sorcerer named Vilgefortz. Regis was killed protecting Yennefer, and Vilgefortz ripped him apart, melting him into glass. Regis will confirm that in order to regenerate from such a meticulous deconstruction of his physical form, he sought the help of his close friend Detlaf. He sacrificed a significant amount of blood to bring Regis back. It is implied that Detlaf simply helped the process along, allowing him to recover his entire body in only 8 years, compared to the 50 years he spent recovering from his first death. As for Detlaf, we will learn plenty more about his strength as the story unfolds, but an interesting piece of information given to us by Regis tells us a bit more about the nature of higher vampires. Unlike common beasts and monsters, higher vampires are far more complex in their motives and seem to have clear consciences. When the Brute of Lyria was at large three centuries prior in the year 964, 200 innocents lay dead in the fields, most of which were women and children. It was in fact Detlaf who put a stop to the Brute, an act of altruism you couldn't expect from most creatures in the universe. But one thing is clear from his elusiveness thus far, and his ability to regenerate Regis. We have not seen anything of his true power yet. We will then head to the Mare Lachey Long Cemetery, where Regis has a hideout. Criminally typical despite how atypical higher vampires seem to be. If we choose to have a swig of his famous Mandrake Moonshine, we can learn a little more about Regis' life as a higher vampire. Asking about death and regeneration will lead him to tell us, if one of our own strikes the deadly blow, death is permanent. There can be no rebirth. One of the chief reasons why vampires long ago swore never to fight one another. So the biology of a higher vampire seems to play a big part in their values and etiquette. It seems that for the most part they are content to stay out of each other's way, for assimilating into human society is tricky enough as it is. And he can give us some fascinating information about what higher vampires feel when they die. Seeing as they can be rebuilt from a smear of blood or a single chunk of flesh, it begs an interesting question about the soul and where it goes. Regis says, We vampires differ exceedingly from you humans. Our matter, that of which we are composed, can exist without form. We require neither a heart, nor a brain, nor air to breathe. I guess that makes sense considering how easily they can shift their form into a red mist. He goes on to say, 
Only after rebirth did I begin to understand that what I had felt was cold and unimaginable fear. If not for Detlaf, I might have drowned in an eternity of icy terror. Frost and ice seem to be a metaphor for death and the conclusion of cycles in the Witcher universe. The Wild Hunt brings ice in their wake, and it is the White Frost that brings planets to their end. Either way, Regis' description of emptiness, of nothingness, really emphasises the difference between humans and higher vampires. The creatures may be able to shift into a human form, and they may be intelligent, sapient and articulate, but that does not make them human by any means. I'll get more into this when speaking about the Unseen Elders, but for those unaware, higher vampires and all vampires for that matter, are post-conjunction creatures. They are their own race that migrated to this world like the humans did. So unlike the Elder Scrolls or any portrayal of vampires we know, vampires are not created from the passing of a virus or from non-fatal bites. No, vampires are their own race and humans will never be able to become vampires. He'll then speak more about his personal life after recovering. Once I could at last stand unassisted, I set off for Bruges, for my one-time home of Dillingen. There I led a peaceful life of a rural healer and surgeon, enjoying my neighbour's respect and in fact, constituting the exact opposite of the monstrous vampire the populace imagines. This won't be the last time Regis speaks of his woes integrating into human society, but it is a startling reminder that, while vampires are horrors worthy of a pitchfork to the gut for most of the common rabble, the higher vampires generally just want to be left alone. It is said they are exceedingly rare to find in this world, even though we find several during our time in Beauclair. But that could very easily be simply a result of their efforts to go unnoticed. A higher vampire will not trigger the vibrations of a witch's medallion, they will not be adversely affected by sunlight, and the only reliable methods for telling them apart from humans is by closely examining their teeth, or by looking for their shadow or reflection in the mirror. This does not apply to the Unseen Elders, we'll get into them soon, but the Elders are far older than normal higher vampires, and they make no attempts to appear human, instead living in complete isolation. Once we have the ingredients for Resonance, the concoction that will grant us access to Detlaf's memories, Regis will give us some insight into how higher vampires transform. When a higher vampire turns into its more feral state, as we saw when fighting Detlaf, and when Regis confronted him, the vampire's blood becomes agitated. As they change their corporeal shell, moulding their flesh to whatever form they are adopting, their blood's chemical composition changes as well. This makes sense considering the natural form for a lot of vampires is far larger than their human form. Regis's natural form is a good example. The transformation is linked to the higher vampire inducing in themselves a state of strong psychokinetic arousal, or in brief, madness or rabidity. So we must help Regis trigger the very thing he has been trying to avoid since his youth. We must fuel his bloodlust, and there just so happens to be one place designed for the controlled induction of psychokinetic arousal, Tesham Mutna. Tesham Mutna was an ancient stronghold, now a ruin, and after the conjunction of the spheres, many vampires made this place their home. But it soon became the home to something far more sinister, when one higher vampire got out of control. Regis says, It is a place of torment, a torture chamber. Long ago, shortly after we'd arrived in this world, one among us named Kagmar developed such a taste and lust for human blood that in one night he could imbibe an entire village. This brought trouble on the entire species. Common folk wearied quickly of living in constant fear. They began to hunt us, seek the aid of mages and witches in tracking us down. And even though they could not be killed by humans, he says, they were bothersome. Forgive the comparison, but when did you last enjoy mosquitoes buzzing around your head? In any case, the other vampires decided something had to be done. Kagmar had to be caught and punished. A torture chamber was thus outfitted in the dungeons of Tesham Mutna. Inside it, a cage made entirely of a special alloy of silver, dalvanite and meteorite steel. Kagmar was captured and locked in this cage, sat there over two centuries, driven to fury time after time, never able to escape. Thus I know the cage will withstand the fury to which we will drive my humble being. And when we arrive at the old stronghold, we see that the entryway is guarded by higher vampire technology. They were able to create mechanisms that would only react to higher vampire blood. If the legends and stories seem too surreal to be believed, one must only venture into the depths of Tesham Mutna to see there was no exaggeration. The higher vampires obviously had a hard time settling into a world where they were highly outnumbered by their prey. And for some like Kagmar, the temptation of fresh human blood was far too tantalizing to turn down. 
As we descend the steps, Regis will tell us why Toussaint is so important to the higher vampires. During the conjunction, the gate from the vampire world into this one opens somewhere in Toussaint, no doubt hidden very well from the other races residing there. In one of the first rooms, we can find a chest which contains the Teshan Mutna armor, sword, and trousers. The scroll resting atop the chest states the following, I am he who serves the tribe. Exalted above men, I renounce human weakness. Uplifted above men, I become the keeper of my flock. Filled with strength, I turn my sword against the enemies of the tribe. I am master and slave. I am executor of the will of the tribe. I accept this sword and this armor so I may serve the tribe. There is plenty to speculate about in regards to this scroll and this beautiful set of armor, but exactly why it was forged and who this tribe was is unclear. But we learn from Regis that these tribes carved glyphs into the rock and coated them in blood. It appears that these tribes of higher vampires dispersed across the world after the conjunction, and the symbols here are reminders of where they all come from, but I'll get into that a bit later on. It seems contrary to higher vampire society to kill with swords, while at the same time humans couldn't access the stronghold without a higher vampire's blood and they were not here as warriors, only animals to be bred and consumed. The book on the table beside it begs another question. It is titled Human Husbandry and Care, and an optimist may suggest it is an attempt to help their race coexist with humans, but the reality is, higher vampires studied human like cattle and bred them in captivity. It suggests that the best way to get high quality human blood is by giving them freedom, perhaps the whole of Beauclair as their field. But there is no doubt that Teshan Mutna was used for far more than just the torture of Kagmar. The abundance of cages and cells around every corner suddenly seemed that much more sickening. The book alludes to the fact that there were attempts to breed the humans in places with little to no oxygen, and they likely weren't given room to sleep or frequent meals until amendments were made to their studies. And as we descend the winding stairs, passing hanging skeletons and cages suspended from the rafters, we can see that not all higher vampires share the same propensity for empathy as our friend Regis. The next book found in the fortress is titled Battery Cage vs Free Range Humans, and it discusses the pros and cons of raising the tasty as humans. The cages along the corridors ahead make a lot of sense with this context. Here the humans were contained, and their incarceration made them less aggressive, more cooperative to feeding. Amidst the cells and skeletons, we can find an old transcript from a conversation between the higher vampire, called Master Ezekiel Hildegard, and a human prisoner named Alex Biscon. The conversation goes as follows. Who are you? My name is Alex Biscon. Why is all your skin trembling? I'm scared, sir. You're scared? I don't understand. You don't know what fear is, sir? No, I have mastered your language, yet some concepts are beyond me. What is fear? It's a feeling that destroys every other feeling. It controls your head and your heart. What do you mean? I thought it was a kind of pain. I have carried out tests in my laboratory on people, and I discovered that a mother subject to appropriate stimuli is able to forget about her child and think only about how to avoid pain. So fear would be similar to pain? No, pain rules the body, but fear is born in the heart. Ooh, yes. What you say is very interesting. I think I will have to examine your heart in the laboratory. What do you mean examine? I mean examine. Take it out and subject it to proper examination. But sir, that would kill me. Yes, your mortality is a great inconvenience, but it was not me who created your species, and I'm not responsible for its excessive frailty. The hopelessness of this exchange is startling. As humans, it is hard to conceive the thought of not being the most powerful, or at least the most intelligent of all the beings in the world. But in this universe, while humans may be able to outsmart most of the beasts they encounter, they are simply outmatched in every way by higher vampires. To them, humans are just intelligent cattle. If angered, they can prove to be an annoyance. But the inconvenience a human brings to a higher vampire is that of a pest, not a threat. Thankfully, so many years later, it seems like the higher vampires have changed their ways, at least allowing the humans their freedom in between feedings. But here in Teshan Mutna, humans were not simply used for controlled feeding. We learn from Regis that in order to torment Kagmar, they systematically captured humans and carried out slow bloodlettings, dragging the pain out. The humans were useful only for their blood, and that made them as valuable as a worm hooked on a fishing pole. The higher vampires spared no time for sympathy. With more humane baits set by Geralt, we can witness Regis's bloodlust from behind the safety of silver, dalvanite, and meteorite alloy bars. 
Our next encounter with the higher vampires of Toussaint comes at the Lady Oriana's estate, and this meeting will rehash the question, what classifies a higher vampire? You see, the owner of this estate is also a vampire, and we can confirm this by referring to the pre-launch trailer, A Night to Remember. Geralt will someday hunt this alluring woman down, before she transforms into a Bruxa. As we stated before, Bruxae are not higher vampires if we define higher vampires as those who can only be killed by their own kind. But at the same time it is clear she is very intelligent, and she meshes into higher vampire society without difficulty. There is far more to this Bruxa than simply a wealthy connoisseur of the arts, and we'll learn as much very soon. But for now there are some interesting developments in the conversation between Geralt, Anna Henrietta, Oriana, Regis and Detlaf on the balcony. In such an environment it becomes clear just how well higher vampires can blend into human society, and we see the more personal side of the Beast of Beauclair, revealing the emotional and moral motives behind behind his savage deeds. Oriana mentions that she has known Regis for ages, literally, which will also suggest that she is very old, but there is still much confusion over her classification. The narrative designer of Blood and Wine initially considered her a higher vampire, while later retracting the statement and confirming it was better to classify her as simply a Bruxa. The bestiary entry for The Witcher 2 refers to the Bruxa as a member of the Higher Vampires, but that is the only instance in which the two are classed together. Geralt meets plenty of Bruxae in his travels, even killing one in the first book, The Last Wish, and while they often vary in intelligence, there are no known examples of Bruxa who can only be killed by other Higher Vampires. As the story progresses, we will run into Regis and Detlaf once more in the yards of Castle Duntine. Here we can see more of the ferocity with which Higher Vampires fight. While they may be very human-esque in social interactions, the same does not apply for combat. They prefer to strike while invisible with claws as strong and sharp as any forged blade. The only real weakness they seem to have is fire. A well-placed Igni sign will stun a higher vampire, but as we've already discussed, not even a blazing inferno could kill a higher vampire permanently. So far, the true power of a higher vampire has been well hidden. Even in carrying out his meticulous murders, it seems as though Detlaf hasn't called upon half of his abilities. But when the situation escalates and Detlaf is betrayed by his love, we begin to see exactly what these creatures are capable of. On the Night of the Long Fangs, when Detlaf unleashes hell on the city of Beauclair, the appropriate sense of hopeless terror can be felt. No more are they hiding behind human masks. The higher vampires are well and truly out to play. The first thing we'll see is that higher vampires have significant influence over the more abundant lesser vampires of the land, and they can call upon plagues of Alps, Brooksite, Fledders, Garcanes, Ekimaras, and Catacans. Alone, each of these beasts are no trouble for a Witcher, but in organised legions, mobilised by their ability to become bats, no human civilization can hope to withstand. This fateful night will cause the higher vampires to reveal their true colours, a fresh, bloody crimson. Despite the fact that she is not an official member of the Higher Vampires, by the definition we've established in this video, choosing to seek Oriana's help will reveal a secret reminiscent of our discoveries in the ruins of Teshan Mutna. Oriana appears to be a benevolent nurturer, raising children in her establishment, La Compassion Orphanage. But when left alone with the children, she feasts upon them. The innocent youths have nowhere else to go, and offer themselves willingly to her in exchange for a home. The mutual benefit of the situation is overshadowed by its predatory nature. We know that higher vampires do not need blood to live, and that it is more of a luxury to them. The same confirmation is not given to us about lesser vampires. It seems that they are less nuanced, and perhaps give in to baser desires. But for someone of Oriana's intelligence, I'm going to speculate that she does not need it for survival. Instead, she indulges by preying on the helpless, and when Geralt discovers the sinister secret of the orphanage, he vows to return. And while we do not get to play that out in the Blood and Wine expansion, we see through the trailer A Night to Remember that Geralt does in fact carry out his promise, and Oriana is slain presumably never to return. If the lore is ever retconned to confirm that Oriana is a true higher vampire and not simply a Bruxa, maybe Detlaf or Regis will seek out her corpse for regeneration, but I find it highly doubtful. If you've come this far, opting to forego the journey into the land of a thousand fables, you'll instead find yourself at the lair of the unseen elder. Don't go thinking I've forgotten about these fascinating creatures, for these are at the very top of the food chain. If the higher vampire society are the shepherds and humans are the cattle, then the unseen elders are the royalty. 
kings and queens who exist in complete solace, so isolated that their subjects are oblivious to their existence. Now before we enter the Unseen Elders' lair, I'd like to refer back to those symbols we saw within Teshamutna, designed to remind the vampire tribes of their origins prior to the conjunction of the spheres. You'll notice three symbols. The first displays a snake coiled around an open palm. This symbol represents the Tedet tribe. According to Regis, this ancient tribe is not found in the Northern Kingdoms or Nilfgaard, and instead migrated east beyond the Blue Mountains. Then we have the Amurun tribe, which is represented by the symbol of the hand wielding a downward facing dagger. This tribe left as well, in the opposite direction, venturing beyond the Great Sea. That leaves one, the Garasham tribe. This tribe is represented by the drop of blood on the palm and the fingertips of the hand. This is the tribe that stayed and decided to assimilate with the Nordlings and the Nilfgaardians. With that in mind, we can safely assume that every vampire and higher vampire we've encountered in the Witcher universe is from the Garisham tribe. Now, the Unseen Elders are the oldest and most powerful of the higher vampires. How many exist in the universe is not clear, but we know that one remains in Toussaint, and he guards the gate through which their kind entered the world. Of this mighty race, no one is more powerful than the Unseen Elder. The only way to access his secluded lair is by using the magic key given to us by Oriana, which features the symbol of the Garasham etched in blood to the stone. Inside, the cave is lined with old paintings, likely done in reverence to the being we're about to meet. And when we enter his lair, we get a glimpse of just how inhuman this race is, despite all their attempts of blending in. The Unseen Elder hangs from the ceiling, and Regis, an extremely powerful higher vampire, is terrified of him. The Elder teleports in the flash of an eye, petrifying Regis' body and paralyzing him in place. Then he disposes of Geralt without the slightest effort. As far as first impressions go, I think we have an idea of just how strong the Unseen Elder is. Of all the entities in the Witcher universe, I can name only one who is stronger, and that is Gauntor Odim. The Unseen Elder commands the obedience of all vampires, regardless of their higher or lesser status. And as I briefly mentioned before, he isn't just hidden here because he despises company. No, the Elder protects an ancient relic, the gateway between worlds that landed the vampire race in the world during the conjunction of the spheres. We will learn as much as we make our way back to Regis. When the cave opens up before us, we see glowing crystal stalactites jutting from the roof, and through them a stream runs. Your eyes are not deceiving you. Here the laws of physics are being tampered with and a waterfall can be seen flowing upwards. Surprisingly, we are not the first humans to see these sights. A note can be found on the ground beside the waterfall, written by an unnamed mage. In order to get here, he had to teleport. He mentions Banard, which is a Cadewenny city known for its magical academy. He then references a mage who is presumably an associate, named Sorel Degelund. Sorel was a mage from Risberg and appeared in the book Season of Storms, which interestingly enough has just this month been released in English. I won't spoil anything for book readers, but I will say that he met Geralt and had a fascination for forbidden experiments. The events of this book happened either 24 or 30 years prior to where we stand now, so whoever this mage is who infiltrated the Elder's lair was not here that long ago by higher vampire standards. As we wander the cave systems, we can find a blood-red variant of our Teshamutna armor. This set is called the Hen Geitva armor, and while there is no information about what this means, we can correlate from the Teshamutna set that this is the original name for the Unseen Elder's lair. Progressing through the cave will really drive home the obscure feeling of this place. It is just so ancient, so untouched by human hands. We can soon find the mage's megascope damaged and surrounded by books. Accompanying them is another note, this one confirming that contact could not be made to Bannard. Perhaps that is for the best. I wonder whether the greater public learning about the Elder's Lair would cause problems. But once again, the cave takes a turn for the surreal just ahead. The stream and the pathway curve up the wall and onto the roof. Gravity's flipped, and now the stalactites are technically stalagmites. Or are they still stalactites? Not far ahead, we can find the dead body of the mage. I guess he never got to confront the Unseen Elder. But that's probably for the best. On him is a crumpled letter featuring words of wisdom from a dean at the Bannard Academy. It seems that the secret to having a successful audience with the Unseen Elder is by genuflecting, uttering words of greeting in their language, and finally placing a gift on the ground. Now the only thing left to do is speak to the Unseen Elder, but beware, as he will not allow you to speak freely and ask as much as you like. 
Nevertheless, there is some useful information we can get from him. If we ask him about the cave, the Elder will confirm that this is the gate between this world and theirs, which would explain the malfunction in gravity. It's as if the pull of both worlds is strong in this one location. The gate is closed, but the Elder believes that one day it will open again. If we ask about Regis, the Elder will say that he sleeps. I doubt it's literal, but who knows, maybe he's powerful enough to induce narcolepsy on his subjects at will. And we can obtain the Elder's assistance in stopping Detlef by referring back to some critical information Regis gave us back at the beginning of our quest. Humans are no threat to the higher vampires, that much is obvious. But should they cause too much trouble, the humans will fight back, disturbing the peace that the Unseen Elders cherish, like a persistent itch that doesn't subside. Outside the lair, Regis seems pleased to be alive. While the vampires forbid infighting, knowing how fatal their conflicts could be for the longevity of the race, I doubt anything Regis's experience can rival that sense of foreboding. Mortality is a concept that humans know too well. Death and grief are staples of our existence, but to a higher vampire such things are alien. Higher vampires face other challenges, and they centre around being a minority. Put in perspective, you can almost feel sorry for them. Yes, they have done reprehensibly egregious things to humans over the centuries, but as Regis says, you arrived by the thousands. We were but a handful. Not much choice. Assimilate with you, or shut ourselves off from the world. Imagine the least comfortable situation you could ever find yourself in. What would it be? I don't mean a moment of pain with death knocking at your door, just a circumstance of great unease. Now imagine you're stuck there. Not for an hour, not for an evening, but for all time. And should you fall out of character for but a moment, should you so much as scratch yourself where the stitching chafes, all around you will scream monster, monster, and they'll turn on you and tear you to shreds. It's an onerous task trying to empathise with a creature we don't understand. To us, existing as a human in human society is second nature. Our culture is created in tandem with our biology, so that we can fulfil our natural purpose. But I must emphasise again that despite their facades, higher vampires are not like us. Not in any way, shape or form. The consequences of death may not be as bad for them, and they may have a long lifespan, but are those benefits worth an entire life of pretending to be something you're not, alone and homesick for all time? Our journey in Toussaint is nearly at an end, and our last encounter with the higher vampires will take place in the most fitting location I could think of, the grounds of Teshamutna. Now, given Detlef's motivations, if he is given his revenge and Siana is killed, we can actually let him live, and he will vow to avoid humans forevermore. But given everything that has happened, this option feels wrong, and chances are your choices up to this point will end in a fight. What lies in store now is a higher vampire giving everything he's got, something we've yet to witness up to this point. And so begins the epic conclusion to the story of the Beast of Beauclair, the most thrilling battle in the Witcher series. Detlaf van der Eretine, a scorned, blackmailed, betrayed and vengeful higher vampire of the Garisham tribe, versus Geralt of Rivia, the White Wolf, the Butcher of Blaviken. When the battle breaks out, we have a moment's respite to prepare. And as we do, the two higher vampires and longtime friends engage in a bitter exchange of fang and claw. Sparks fly as sharpened talons collide, and in their wake, ringing sounds resonate like steel being tempered against an anvil. The ferocity and speed of their swipes are barely visible even to the viper-like eyes of a witcher, yet they counter each other brilliantly, fading to smoke and reappearing trying desperately to get the edge over the other. Such an even match could go on until the sun broke the eastern horizon. I won't try to argue the case of whether a witcher or a higher vampire is stronger in a single fight with all the other factors and contributors held aside. But one thing certainly works in our favour as we intervene. Witches are adaptable, and with the right oils and potions, Geralt can turn the battle in his favour. Quick reactions are the best strategy against Detlaf's vampire form, with well-timed dodges and counter-attacks providing the perfect remedy to his attacks. But when he is hurt enough, he will show us his true form, his monster form. Veins and arteries pull their way to the surface of his transmogrifying skin, pulsating deep purple under flesh gone white. And then, long gnarled talons rip free from his shoulder blades, forming enormous bat wings which beat the air violently, throwing a gust of blood scent at the Witcher. The beast is twice the size of Detlaf's human form, and it swims through the air with dreadful grace. 
He swoops like a bird protecting its nest. Only the weight of his hulking form and his claws like sabers make for a much more deadly strike. Irreverent to the superstitions of mortals, he says in a voice brimming with barbaric malice, if you acknowledge any gods, start praying now. When the swoop is past, he will then call upon darkness incarnate, and a colony of bats assemble at his call. You cannot hope to best the colony, and only swift feet will save you. He will then become incorporeal, almost fluid, as he soaks into the ground, before erupting from the soil like a demented worm. If you've lived this long, you may yet see his final form. When he has been bled enough, and his wings are truncated from his back, he will envelop the Witcher in a powerful illusion. This aspect of the fight is likely a pseudo-hallucination, brought about by the bite Detlaf sunk into Geralt's neck. But either way, the effects are lifelike, almost like sorcery. Once engulfed in a pulsating recreation of Detlaf's chest, he will emerge from a beating heart that acts like a cocoon to his chrysalis. When he drops from the shell, he appears to be pupating, oozing like a grub halfway between transformations. Inside this vulnerable maze of viscera, Geralt can weaken Detlaf by bursting his free hearts, all the while fending off his amorphous apparitions. Upon destroying the vessels and spilling enough blood, Detlaf will fall to the ground, too weak to prevent his fate. Even after his dismemberment at the edge of the Witcher's Blade, the higher vampire clings on to life, and signs of rejuvenation are already beginning to show. The only way to end it once and for all is by the hand of his dear friend Regis. Regis must now violate a sacred code of Witcher society, turning his claws on one of his own to deal a lethal blow. And at that bittersweet moment, a higher vampire breathes his last. A death so rare and profoundly terminal that it likely won't occur again for centuries. One thing is certain though, as it appertains to higher vampire culture, Regis will not be forgiven for what he has done, and other vampires will call him a traitor. As in Regis' words, one is either with us, unconditionally, regardless of the circumstances, or one is not. But an equally ambiguous yet sacred rule in their culture can be summarised as, out of sight, out of mind. If Regis can deal with living a quiet life out of the way of other vampires, he will be just fine. And for a higher vampire like Regis, who makes his home in abandoned cemeteries and drinks mandrake moonshine alone beneath the starlight, I doubt he will have any trouble being forgotten. And on that rather fitting note, we've come to the end of the journey through Toussaint. There are still a few things to do before I go though. The first is to address Hubert Reich, Novigrad's coroner and the culprit in the quest Carnal Sins. Not much needs to be said here, but he is commonly referred to as a higher vampire, so I thought I'd share my two cents. Reich is as much a higher vampire as Oriana is. He is not immortal and can be killed by anyone. He is an ancient Katakan, and Katakans fall among Brookse in terms of social ranking. They are less savage than most lesser vampires, yet like Oriana, when he is cut down by Geralt's silver sword, he is dead forever. In terms of real life folklore and mythology, vampires are of course inspired by the beings of the same name. However, they are portrayed in the witch universe to contradict almost all of the commonly accepted superstitions. Garlic. Wooden stakes, holy water, silver, and sunlight are the well-known ways to ward off or kill a vampire. Yet as we learn through Regis, all of these things are false, and they're likely a way to give helpless humans peace of mind. Some traditions also held that a person must invite a vampire into their home in order to become vulnerable to their attacks. But alas, the higher vampires don't mention such obstacles. In fact, it's quite the contrary. They can turn to mist with such ease that Geralt even quips about Regis being cut out for the life of a thief. Witcher lore is so often inspired by mythology from the real world, and this is one of the rare occurrences where a creature is so completely unlike the perceived interpretation. I guess it lends back to what Regis said outside the Elder's Cave. The vampire race is completely alien to human culture, and one slip up would send a rabble of angry farmers and gallant knights after your head. It is a long and lonesome existence for a higher vampire, and they are equal parts magnificent and frightening. But there you have it guys. If you've come this far, I hope you've enjoyed the journey. Now that we know everything about the higher vampires, I'm gonna head back to Corvo Bianco to work on the full story of the lesser vampires over a goblet of wine. Thank you so much for watching everyone. Feel free to like the video if you think it deserves one. My name is Drew and I will see you in the next one.